Hello, I'm Kevin Benedict, Senior Vice President of Solution Strategies here at Regalix in Mountain View, California today. And I'm just thrilled to have as guests three individuals that are at the heart of innovation and startups. I'll start with you, Jeff. This is Jeff Wallace. He's the co-founder of Silicon Valley In Your Pocket. Jeff, thanks for joining us. Absolutely, thanks, Kevin. All right, and then next we have Cal Deutsch, also a co-founder of Silicon Valley In Your Pocket. And then we have, Cal, how do we say that? Cali in, uh, Ilunga. That's good, Cali Ilunga. All right, Cali. Yeah, just so, to make it tough, we're tossing a Cal and a Cali at you. I know it, so <laughs> we have Cal, Cali, I mean Cali, Cal, and Jeff. Uh, to my right. So guys, thanks again for joining us today. You're right here in the heart of the, in the Bay Area and Silicon Valley. Talk to us a little bit. Jeff, why don't we start with you? Why don't you introduce what is Silicon Valley in your pocket? And what fun things do you guys get to do on a daily basis? Absolutely. So Silicon Valley in your pocket is a platform that allows us to provide global entrepreneurs, and that includes the United States, uh, which is part of the globe. So when we say global entrepreneurs, we mean entrepreneurs really anywhere in the world. And it allows us to provide them a combination of coaching, content, and methodology, uh, the best practices, if you will, and uh, again, connections is probably a big piece as well. So our three C's of what we offer to entrepreneurs is a combination of content coaching and, and connections. But rather than entrepreneurs feeling the necessity or the urge to move and relocate from wherever they may be to Silicon Valley to kind of pursue their you know kind of dreams as an entrepreneur, we feel that it's best if we can provide them those best practices wherever they are, keeping their cost structures low and yet providing them the best methodologies and approaches that Silicon Valley has to offer. That's the name Silicon Valley in your pocket, right? Exactly. The idea is if, as long as you have a digital connection, we can provide you those things wherever you may be in the world. Oh, very exciting. So let me ask the three of you, how has founding a startup company, how has that process changed over the last decade? Why don't we start with you, Cal? Yeah, so uh, I, I think back to my first startup, um, I, I started my career at a lot of really, really big companies like uh, Wells Fargo Bank and Visa and Price Waterhouse, and then caught the, uh, you know, the startup fever during the first dot-com wave in the late 90s, uh, which was a real estate tech startup. It was basically the first Zillow before there was a Zillow. So there was a home valuation tool, but in the late 90s. So it didn't have all the cool, you know, maps and all that stuff. But still, you know, we, we did quite well. It was called Home Gain. Uh, our, our monthly hosting cost for web hosting services when it was just an early on business was well into the six figures. Just, mm -hmm. just web hosting. And that's before you've built, you know, one bit of code. Um, the wonderful opportunity today is that it is frankly so much more cost effective to start a company. And that is the big democratizing opportunity that uh, you go to an accelerator program, you come to Silicon Valley in your pocket and uh, you get turn, you know, introductions to law firms and they either give you some free law services or you can uh, get deferred billing um, or you can get a turnkey corporate service for a few hundred dollars. So basically creating the company is that cheap. You get free web hosting credits from Amazon or from uh, Alibaba or fra from IBM. Um, all the tools are now ge being given to you that literally, if you're a talented coder or if you find a talented coder, you can literally bring something to market and start monetizing on truly a shoestring budget. You just need to know what you're doing. And I think that's the great opportunity. And that's why I truly think we're moving away from uh, or evolving from a pure capitalistic uh, society to a, an entrepreneurial society. People can create wealth just with elbow grease and energy and passion. And, uh, you know, I just love being part of the, the team that's helping to enable that uh, in the U.S. and globally. Wow. So, Callie, how have you seen a startup, a founding a startup change? Well, I started my first startup about 12 years ago. 
and I'm, you know, I'm the young one in the crew. Um, so you're talking about my whole adult life, but <laughs> what I have, what is different is the funding sources. Um, when I talk to my peers that are raising funding right now, everything from crowdfunding to ICOs to the fact that you can bridge to Silicon Valley through services like ours and others, no matter where you are in the world, the idea that um, you have a plethora of options when you're trying to get that first um, boost for your business financially is great. Versus 10 years ago, even for me, you know, my first calls were to banks. Yeah. Um, and then hard to reach investors. Whereas my wife, who just started a startup, got her first 25,000 by having a video on a crowdfunding website. So oh, wow. I think that's exciting for entrepreneurs locally and abroad. Got it. So Jeff, you've been doing this forever as well. You and I are passive, our careers have passive, uh, met many times in uh, over the last few decades. What's your thoughts there? How have you seen it change? Yeah, I think, you know, combining a little bit of what Cal and Callie both have commented on, I think the infrastructure to build a startup nowadays is so much cheaper, so much more readily available and accessible. You don't have to know everything anymore. You know, it used to be you had to know how to do a lot of things as an entrepreneur. The, you, you, the, the kind of you had to wear a lot of hats, you know, wear many hats. Now, a lot of those basic infrastructural things for a business, establishing the corporate entity. You don't have to be a lawyer to do that. For mm -hmm. We have a, a partnership, for example, with Stripe. It's a program called Stripe Atlas for just $500 US. You can have a Delaware C Corporation and establish a bank account at Silicon Valley Bank. You can get some free legal and free tax and accounting advice for five hundred dollars. Wow! Yeah. And it and it takes you know uh, maybe a couple of days from the time you enter. It takes about thirty minutes to enter the information, and maybe within a matter of you know forty eight hours, you have your Delaware C Corporation, a bank account. You have everything kind of that's required for say investors to be willing to take a look at you. And so you know the amazing how low and how e low cost and how easy this stuff has become. And as Cal kind of referenced. The hosting you used to have to think about setting up a server and who's going to you know hire an IT guy to manage the server. Now it's a, a, a click on a button on an Amazon website you know website to establish a new server and have AWS up and running. Oh man! So it's just it's the costs and the hurdles are much lower to establish a business and it allows entrepreneurs I think to focus on the core of their business. But to me, that's one of the most important benefits that entrepreneurs have in today's you know environment is they really just get to hone in and focus on the core of their business so what impact has both mobile and cloud-based services had on startups you know i can think you know if i go back to the first time when i was running a software company it was 1992 <laughs> And, you know, everything was on premise. You had to have, you would go buy all the books. You had stacks of books next to you so you'd figure out how to do proper accounting. <laughs> you know, everything yeah. Yeah. had to be so, done in your office. So what kinds of services you see out there that just make starting that company super easy? So, yeah, I mean, I think the first thing is that it has a huge impact on market, right? So the people you can reach, because all of us have this thing in our hands. Yes. It's just completely different. When you think about, um, you know, 20 years ago, you had a startup, someone was going to tell you, hey, how, how are you going to think about advertising? How are you going to go to market? And you'd probably say radio, you'd probably say TV, and that's going to cost money that most startups didn't have. Now, a viable answer is to say, you know, I might put it on an app and might put all my money in making sure that people refer each other phone to phone to phone to phone. So all of a sudden your cost for going to market because of this device that's in everyone's hand has just plummeted. Um, and obviously the user experience benefits, right? The idea that you could have had a laundry, um, you know, 20 years ago, but now with the phone, maybe people are pre booking that laundry service and, you know, deciding on the time that yeah. they come. And so the user experience benefits of, being able to conduct business on your phone is incredible. And when you add that to how that helps you go to market, it's, it's transformational. So, you know, we see lots of companies um, come through and, you know, you guys can correct me where I'm wrong, but I don't even know if, I think most people just assume <laughs> there's gonna be a mobile experience. You know, the days of your business not having a mobile experience are, are fast ending. I think the basic assumption is that my business will in some way or other um, interact with 
mobile. So great. Yeah. Well, thank so, you, thank Kelly. You. Cal, what about you? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add the, the other reason that I had mentioned, Kelly, you had asked about cloud services and uh, Kelly within our team is basically the Zapier king. And Zapier is the company that basically makes it super easy to do data integrations with different applications. So um, we frankly rely heavily on that. We're not gonna build something if somebody else out there has built it. So when we talk about AP and AR, payroll services, uh, payment processing, uh, uh, CRM, uh, email list management, all of these things with a click of a button now are systematically integrated in the cloud and uh, you know managing unsubscribes and being GDPR compliant. Uh, it has never been easier. I mean, like I said, when I started my career and did my first newsletter at the home game a gazillion years ago, uh, we did have an outsourced vendor, but it was certainly not integrated the way it is today. And uh, it, it makes the job easier, it makes the job more analytical, and it makes it uh, funner right. and um, more measurable. Um, I'm, I'm very much driven by the metrics and just the data keeps coming in and we can have you know some of the greatest anal analytical reports out there. Um, it is just a great time to use these tools. And given that a lot of them sort of on, are on this freemium model, where something, you know, when you're low volume, you can get a MailChimp account for free up to 2,000 oh, yeah. years. Free cool. conference calls, free web, <laughs> you know, everything. Yeah, exactly. The tools are out there to start and they are willing to, to, to price low for you and then grow with you and sort of share in your risk and your success. And that's the opportunity that all entrepreneurs need to know that the tools are there ready to be used and to, to be scaled. It's oh, amazing man, I think what it's... difference there is since the 1800s when you were starting your first business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm, so I'm thinking about, um, you know, accounting and expense reports and even renting office space. You can go to WeWorks or one of the uh, uh, similar kinds of vendors out there. All these things that change the world for an entrepreneur. Now it's all about creativity and coming up with that winning idea. So on that note, let's talk about what are the winning ideas you guys are hearing out there. Where where do you think you know the hot areas are for innovation? You know, to me, Kevin, it's it's not about the hot technologies. I know you and I talk a lot in, in our lifetimes together around different technologies and in today's day and age, you know, you hear about artificial intelligence or AR, VR, or blockchain. Um, we kind of focus on what's the problem you're solving? And is it a real pain, true pain point? Is it kind of a must have versus a nice to have? So it's less to me about the technology or the, the kind of bell or whistle, whatever, you know, uh, the startup entrepreneurs are coming to us with. Uh, whether you're doing an ICO, you know, to, to raise your capital. It's like, to me, you have to be solving a real problem that that target customers deem worthy that your solution is going to help them resolve. And it's got to resolve at that level. If it doesn't solve some real pain for somebody, I really don't care if you have a cool blockchain, AI, VR, it's irrelevant to me. Now, those are good technologies, but they have to be solving real market problems and challenges. So at the end of the day, for us, it's all about product market fit and market validation. It's less about the technology that's solving for it. And if the technology happens to be a tool towards that solution, then that's fantastic. Um, but, but to me, the good ideas, uh, you ask a little bit about what are the good ideas. I just think they're ones that look at, at the market and the environments that people are living and dealing in today and figuring out where those pain points are and how they can be addressed through some form of a solution, whether it's a cool new technology or just a, you know, a standard regular, even a mobile app today, just a basic mobile app still might be able to solve for a, a problem nobody has solved before. Oh, wow. I'll leave it there and let Callie or, or yeah. Cal chime in as well. I, I, I think you, you summed it up perfectly. Surprise, surprise. I'm in agreement with you. <laughs> um, just to sort of expand on that, um, as I said, my background is in banking and payments. Um, I was involved in the team that helped bring to the U.S. Mondex, for example, which was one of the first e-cash platforms uh, in the late 90s. Uh, it didn't, it, we had projected that it would replace paper cash by the year 2000, we kind of missed the mark with that. Um, but because of that, I still have a passion for the space. Um, we've worked with blockchain companies, so my LinkedIn profile has the keyword blockchain. I get a lot of inbound 
uh, blockchain um, requests uh, from startups. Uh, I love the space. Unfortunately, though, I see blockchain as a tool. It is something that is a great enabler. It's a distributed ledger. I get it. I understand it. A lot of the inbound things I get talk about blockchain for the sake of blockchain. And again, don't talk to me about blockchain. I get it. There are uh, easily accessible uh, you know, commercial platforms. There's open source software. That's not the big deal. Tell me the problem that you're solving. How are you using it? And how are you going to be monetizing it? And unfortunately, a lot of the entrepreneurs just think about the tool. To me, it's basically like a, a contractor saying, hey, I have a hammer, as opposed to saying, I'm going to build a house. So let's have the conversation about what house we're building. Got it. So there's a word that's always hard for me to say, but combinatorial. So the ability to combine various services and technologies into a company, a startup, or to combine different things into a new technology stack that offers value. Where are you seeing those kinds of things being developed today that you find interesting? Take a stab at that. So I've been interested in lots of the activity in legal tech right now. So, you know, everyone, it's a huge $400 billion market, um, but legal is, is a slow market, right? The people who are there have been there for a while. Um, and we find that law firms are slow to move and it's just a, a slow moving market. And so it's ripe for disruption. So in terms of the combinatorial <laughs> um, ideas that are out there, we find that because it's such a stale and slow moving industry, we've seen startups that just improve billing or improve access to mm -hmm. justice or improve, you know, something that is measurable in ad tech and has been for years, but hasn't been put into the legal sector and so i'm excited about the impact on justice these ideas are having and the impact on the cost of legal services and see startups in the space that are taking ideas from different silos you wouldn't expect like advertising and mm -hmm. um, fashion even and applying them to legal um i think speaks to what you're talking about around you know cross siloing and cross pollinating ideas to create something of value for people absolutely Anything, anybody else want to add to that, Jeff? Uh, yeah, I do have one thing I want to add. You, what you were saying, Kevin, about the combinatorial aspects and com combining different things. You know, the one thing that I know the three of us on this side will agree on, because we see it all the time, is um, the notion that a great idea does not in and of itself make a great business. Yes. And so even at that combinatorial level, it's combining great ideas with great business practices and processes that's what will make for a viable sustainable business we see a lot of times you get very brilliant and very creative and innovative people coming to the, the table with a, a really awesome idea and it's rarely the idea that isn't of interest to us i mean that happens on occasion but normally these are just innovative creative people that have a, a cool idea the question is can are, are they the ones either they as an individual entrepreneur which we could talk about later or the team that's assembled around that idea and in that business are they the ones to execute and take that business idea to market and make it a real business not just a business idea and so there's a, to me the combinatorial aspect when you said that that's something that popped into my mind it's not just about great ideas it's about the ability to execute them and create great businesses from them yeah and i think advisors like you guys and coaches like you guys are there to help the innovators recognize is their good idea a feature or is it a business <laughs> yeah no, that's sometimes it's just a really yeah. good feature that should be on somebody else's product absolutely exactly. absolutely um with that you guys uh for your livelihood and, and what you're doing today as you're coaching these uh, entrepreneurs are there um categories of challenges that you kind of see across the board like here's some standard five big challenges that founding uh, entrepreneurs seem to always run into. And if so, what are some of those challenges? Uh, I guess I'll take the first crack. The first challenge they always see for themselves is the fundraising thing. Okay. And it is, it feels extremely hard to them. And the truth is for most of them, that's because they are working on something that's not investable at that point. 
And uh, we have seen time and time again, if you create something and work on it long enough that you are creating something investable, you will get investment. And the problem is most of the pitches we see, they ask for the investment. And uh, part of what we do is teach them to understand from the perspective of the investor, how to think, what is the return on investment? And they f always fail in articulating the return on the return on investment. If it's just too early stage and they haven't validated the business model, they haven't shown enough traction, they haven't shown a path to scale, to build the right team, to build the sales distribution model. Those are all the things that sort of help validate that there will ultimately be a return on investment. And it, is, it, it means that you have to be self-aware as you're building out your business and how to prioritize what you do, as well as how you build that narrative to investors to show that you get their mindset that uh, you are working towards something that is investable and that will ultimately provide that return to the investor. So yes, for five, I'm happy to toss up more, <laughs> maybe toss it over to Kelly or Jeff if you guys have any. Who wants to go next? What are the things, do you, what are, where do you guys zero in when you're coaching your uh, founding entrepreneurs? I'll go, I'll, I'll keep awesome. <laughs> Here, Here's the next one that just, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I vent to you guys as well. Um, how many times have we gotten pitches and either they say they have no competitors or their competitor is Facebook and Google? And uh, I don't know if on your show, Kevin, if I can swear, <laughs> my response to them is usually um, Facebook and Google do not know who the bleep you are. Yes. Give a bleep. Uh, that's the reality because they're even if they're in a completely different vertical. I mean, it, it yes. just doesn't work that way. So um, just teaching them how to do a good competitive analysis, which is not just, uh, you know, the established known companies. It's other companies that might also be in stealth mode, maybe something that's in a patent filing. Uh, a competitor is the inertia of the status quo, the way things are today. And uh, I have had pitches where our, people say, well, my competitor is a spreadsheet. And my response is, well, the spreadsheet works. The spreadsheet's on your computer already, or it's on Google Sheets, and it's free. And now you have to talk somebody into opening up their wallet or their credit card and paying you. Yes. That is your competitor. And that's still a very, very tough mountain to climb. Oh, yeah. And uh, again, it's all doable. If you have a compelling product, you can take down the spreadsheet. I mean, there are lots of examples that have done that. Oh, yeah. But you have to be realistic about that landscape. Uh, and the other part of competitors that I always bring up is simply geography. Uh, I'm not going to name names here, but we had one company that went th through our accelerator that uh, launched here, actually had a very notable client, but he's in the Bay Area and has a dozen direct competitors. Mm. Uh, I was doing a boot camp in Asia, met the exact same company, but the Asian equivalent whose go-to market was um, Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, and Taiwan. And that company uh, recently had a unicorn exit. Wow. That same business model, different geography. So it, it's that kind of multi, I mean, ultimately you're playing a multi-dimensional game of chess to figure out how you will succeed and thrive and scale. And uh, it's doable, but just don't come in with that confidence that on day one, you, you've got your competitors nailed. Right? Flat out 90% of the time, they don't. Jeff, let's zero in on you. What kind of coaching would you always look to give a founding entrepreneur? Yeah, I think there's probably a few key things that you know I hone in on from my perspective. And that's the beauty of our team is the three of us each have very different perspectives. And so when we are working with entrepreneurs, they get the benefit of getting that, you know, various perspectives. So um, for me, one of the biggest things that I work on with entrepreneurs is their storytelling. You could have an absolutely brilliant idea, uh, maybe a breakthrough medical innovation, whatever it might be. If you cannot properly communicate it to investors, to channel partners, to any other key stakeholders, it really is unlikely going to move anywhere fast. Wow. And so helping entrepreneurs craft their stories. And I'll give you just one minor example. We had an, uh, an entrepreneur had a very, very innovative medical um, solution, a medical technology he had, had developed to detect early detection actually of cancers 
a variety of forms of cancer. Um, and the way he was communicating his story was more from the science side of it. And unfortunately, in many cases, when you're dealing with a, a very technical or medical uh, kind of solution, the audience isn't going to be at the same level as you. And so when you're communicating from that perspective, a lot of it's going to go over the heads of the audience. And that's a bad thing to happen, right? If you're talking to would-be investors, they may not be medical doctors or scientists that understand. But if you make it relatable to them, then they can at least get uh, an excitement and enthusiasm and inquisitiveness to learn more. And that is the objective you should have as an entrepreneur when you're presenting, is make the audience want to know more. And so we worked uh, in, a, in that program with this gentleman and he did an absolutely stellar job making it very relatable because he happened to have a family member who passed away from uh, cancer, which was diagnosed in a late advanced stage. Oh man. And had she had the opportunity to have a solution like his, it, and he even phrased it this way in the room we were in, he said, who's to say she might even be sitting here in the audience with us. Wow. And that's a very powerful way of communicating and that hooks the audience. And so from that point forward, he really had a lot of interest being directed in his direction to hear the rest of his story. And so helping entrepreneurs craft a very compelling and relevant and relatable story is a big area where I like to focus on. And the other area that I personally have a lot of enthusiasm about is the kind of business model. I think there's a lot of people that feel like, well, I have a B2C solution. And when you think about the costs of trying to go after a large amount of consumers, it's yes. very, very costly. But if you think about finding channel partners that might also already be dealing with those same target audiences or target customers, crafting an innovative and a creative channel partnership strategy might get you there substantially faster. So looking at ways to modify a business model to accelerate the time to market. Those are things that I personally enjoy working with entrepreneurs amongst a host of others, but those are ones that I have particular you know, wow. interest in. Thanks for sharing that, Jeff. Callie, what do you think? Yeah, I'll, I'll add on to what Jeff and Cal said. We, we obviously come at this in the same way, but you'd be to Jeff's last point, you'd be amazed at how many companies get away with not having a business model. <laughs> we actually had a, um, a not to be named uh, client the other day who's won a couple of competitions, who's I think raised about $400,000. And so, you know, you kind of get in love with that kind of momentum and you go, oh, but I'm, you know, I must be doing well because I'm getting all this attention and I'm, you know, growing. But he didn't have, after a couple of years, a business model. Show us how money leaves the customer's pocket <laughs> and enters your account. <laughs> and so often we end up focusing on traction, right? Which is great. We, we love all these competitions you've won. Um, but let's get this into the hands of paying clients. So, um, you know, Jeff has crafted a pilot program. We will get small, small startups to pilot with perhaps, you know, a big corporate as an example, just to get them in market. Um, with actual customers and typically the precondition is with the customer hey when this pilot is over and we've hit milestone one two and three we'd love to continue beyond that at this um, price rate so I think traction you know goes hand in hand with that business model where we're saying show us how money will move into your account um, and what are the things we need to do to get you there I'd like Wait. to just add if I can Kevin a quick mm -hmm. comment on what Callie said because it's so important and I'll, I'll do it, I'll add my point by way of an example to expound on what Callie mentioned. So we do have this, what we call one page pilot program. And it is a very simplistic pilot approach that allows entrepreneurs to be able to uh, present the opportunity to pilot or trial with uh, other enterprises or other uh, companies. In one example, uh, we had an entrepreneur who we were working with, he was doing well but not having the success with investors that he wanted to and even the traction in the marketplace he was still kind of developing so it's kind of like working on the plane while you're in flight kind of thing um, but nonetheless he was struggling a bit with attention um, predominantly from the investment community and one of the things we said to him was stop asking for investment and start asking for traction because if you can demonstrate traction with the right players the investment discussions go substantially easier. 
So to carry that example forward, it's a very specific individual we're、um, referring to. In February, we held an event, a pitch event, during which five CEOs were presenting their products. They all had the standard kind of seven, ten-minute pitch、yes. to an, an audience of key stakeholders, investors, partners, etc. And in the ask slide, which is a common slide, you are you're normally saying we're raising X amount of dollars, and we under these terms, we actually switched up the terms on them, and we said your ask slide can't have a dollar sign on it. So all you can ask for is a pilot. We want to see you ask these audience members for either pilots with their own organizations or introductions to people within their networks that you could go pilot test your solution with. Now this one individual did that. He followed suit. He was one of five, and at the end of that event, seven days from the pitch event that he did, he secured a pilot in Asia. And he's based here in the Bay Area. He ran that pilot in Asia.、Uh, by the time it started, it was probably April, mid-April. By the time it got launched, he ran that until June. Uh, successfully, there were a few wrinkles along the way. They were very collaborative because they understood it was a pilot to achieve、mm -hmm. a, an outcome that wasn't going to be perfect along the way. That there might be wrinkles. So the partner worked very collaboratively with them. They successfully completed it, and upon that completion, he was asked for three new client accounts that they wanted to install it in and a white label opportunity. And now、wow. his investment conversations are going substantially easier because this partner that we're referring to. Is a globally recognized name, and so、sure. any investors look at that and say, "Wow, if they're working with you, there must be something here." And so that that approach to gaining traction before running around asking for dollars, we always say, "Run really lean until you have traction. Then you can start to spend a little more because the money is not as far away." Absolutely. So thank you guys for sharing that. Last question before we wrap it up today: How has the funding environment changed over the last decade? Jeff, let's start with you. Yeah, I think、um, the funding environment to me has changed a little bit in that the friends and family rounds.、Um, I find them to be much easier. I think people have richer and more friends and family nowadays. I'm always astounded when. People、That's only because we're older now, Jeff. <laughs> I just didn't have as good friends and family, I guess, when I was an <laughs> entrepreneur.、Uh, but friends and family can really move a lot of companies. I mean, it's amazing the percentage of companies that actually do secure friends and family money. And it is, in terms of investment dollars, it actually is the largest category of dollars invested into startups. It's larger than VC and angel investors and corporate venture combined. Wow.、Uh, in, in aggregate,、and、that's not normally understood by people intuitively. So friends and family、um, is there in a way as a as a、uh, means of supporting early stage entrepreneurs more so, and I also think angel investment has really grown and blossomed、uh, over the last say decade or two, and now it is a very very viable. You you could see people raising a combination of friends and family and angel all the way up to seven figures of financing, and、mm -hmm. in that lower cost infrastructure environment that we spoke about in the beginning,、um, that that money can carry you、uh, quite a far way. And so I think it's just gotten easier if you have a good idea、um, to get that initial, you know, seed capital, whichever category it comes from, to move it further along and hopefully get to a more、uh, arm's length, you know, investor to be able to be willing to put more investment in. Wow, Cal, from your experience, how's the funding environment changed? Yeah, so what I see, I, I'm part of the、uh, committee over at、uh, the Berkeley Angel Network, which is an angel group for, of, and by UC Berkeley alums, and、uh, the deal flow is very good. It, it's a very efficient marketplace. So more and more, we're seeing companies that have more traction, post revenue companies that are sort of get, approaching that, you know, the hockey stick in their sales cycle, and.、Um, There is more pressure on the early stage company、uh, companies to basically rely on the friends and families to get that funding. If you don't have that validation and the traction yet,、mm -hmm. uh, the one exception I would say is if you are a true IP play where you have like you know a series of patents and and、uh, a true competitive、uh, advantage or barrier to entry, and you know something that just came out of the university, that might be funded pre revenue. But if you're more of a market execution, that basically you're, you know, let's say you're the Uber of, you know, pick your industry, you will have to show some true market validation before you would get any sort of institutional investment. 
Mm. So um, overall, I would still say it, it's it's uh, VC firms have moved downstream where they might focus on the seed round as well for the IP competitive advantage type uh, plays. Uh, and then, uh, you know, angel groups have moved upstream to, you know, have access to larger deals and later stage deals. So it's uh, becoming an efficient market. And I think the entrepreneurs have responded, like Jeff said, looking more to ICOs or to other crowdfunding solutions. Um, so at the end of the day, a buck's a buck or a Bitcoin's a Bitcoin. Yes. Uh, and they don't care where the, the, the currency comes from. And uh, I, I think it will continue to evolve in that direction um, to basically become a much more efficient marketplace. But, uh, you know, the best deals will be the ones that always attract the best capital. All right. Well, guys, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy Friday to join us here and share your insight and uh, wisdom from your careers and your uh, work with entrepreneurs. So thank you guys very much for joining us today. Thanks a lot, Kevin. As always, it's great talking with you again. Appreciate your time, my friend.